Hello, my dears, Daniela here, and welcome to another episode of the Spa Marketing Made Easy podcast. We have an amazing interview for you guys today. So a while ago, I asked in the Facebook group, if I'm going to interview a doctor, what questions do you guys want to know? And you listed tons of different questions. I was so grateful for everything that you guys were putting on there. I combined those questions into three main themes, which which were, you know, they were all very similar themes of what you guys were asking. And I got Dr. Petropolis on the podcast and asked him these questions for those of you who are interested in medical aesthetics, those of you who are wanting to get into medical and just are curious about how the doctor views estheticians in the practice. So for those of you who you may or may not know, I actually work with Dr. Petropolis once a week. Uh, I go into his practice at Potomac Medical Aesthetics. It keeps my hand in things. It keeps me relevant. It keeps me working with patients. It keeps me fresh on what retail strategies are working because you guys know my big thing is retail. In Spa Retail Rockstar, we teach our students how to increase their sales by 500 to 5,000 per month. And I want to practice what I preach. So, you know, working there, connecting with him, it just keeps me having a pulse on the business. But he's an amazing doctor. It's an amazing practice. I'm so grateful to be there. And I'm so grateful for Dr. Petropolis to share his answers with you guys. So without further ado, let's go ahead and play that interview. All right, Dr. Petropolis, welcome to the Spa Marketing Made Easy podcast. Good morning. (laughs) So the estheticians in our community have been really, really looking forward to this episode because... There's so many that want to get into the world of medical aesthetics and they don't really know how to get there, how to do it. And so when I posted in our Facebook group that I was going to be doing an interview with you, I let them ask some questions. So I, I'm excited to hear your answers for them. Great. <laughs> okay. So tell us a little bit about your journey and how you got into aesthetics in the first place? Because I know that you've been a physician for 20 plus years. Was it, did you ever see yourself getting into aesthetics? Um, I think in the beginning, no. So when I um, finished medical school and had to make a choice of specialty choice, um, I couldn't find one that was perfect fit. But emergency medicine was what I matched in because it gave me the opportunity to pursue so many different aspects of medicine, uh, from orthopedics to cardiology. It was kind of an all-in-one specialty. And in the mid-90s, when I went through plastics and dermatology as uh, part of my rotations in medical school, um, they were interesting, but they weren't the right fit for me at the time. And I think as with many physicians, as we progress through our careers, we figure out what we're really good at and what interests us, and that doesn't always stay the same. So as I advanced in my emergency medicine career, I started to really be more interested in things like dermatology. Um, And as time went on, I started to really see that the field of aesthetics had grown. Um, In the late 2000, early 2010s, I started to really get interested in it. And at that point, decided to start getting educated in that aspect of medicine, start getting my certifications. And my wife and I made a big leap of faith to open up our own practice in 2016. Uh, And I think it's been the best decision that uh, we've made to date. Well, I know one thing that's that's really interesting that I've learned from you after getting to know you a little bit more is that you didn't you have a photography business? I did. It, so you have that aesthetic eye. So there's a you know a lot of times in medicine there there are some doctors that are completely analytical and they just you know can't tell you a different shade of blue from one another, but there are also those that you truly have to have an eye for, especially in aesthetics, for lighting, for, you know, shape of the face, for balance of the face. And, and I see that some of the best physicians, aesthetic physicians have that artistic eye because you have to. So it almost kind of seems like a natural progression, even if you didn't really 
know it going into your, into your, you know, <clears throat> medicine in the, in the beginning? Yeah. Um, I think it's definitely helped. And I don't know if it's a skill set that you are born with, or you can cultivate it. Maybe it's a little bit of both, but in the nineties, when I was in medical school and in residency, I had a, uh, portrait photography business. I also did a lot of automotive racing uh, photography too. So it was a mixed bag, but I really liked doing portraits. And so I would do both commercial for um, location shots for people in business settings, as well as families. I didn't do any, I did an occasional wedding here and there, but what you have to learn within photography when you're shooting portraits is looking at someone's features and recognizing strengths and weaknesses. And we all have strengths and weaknesses, but your lighting as well as the angles in which you shoot the, the portrait really make a difference in how things look. But what I really learned is that people have a very keen sense of what they don't like when they look at themselves in their own photographs. Mm -hmm. So listening to my um, uh, to my clients in the photography world was my best way of making them happy by knowing what they liked and what they didn't like. But sometimes they weren't sure. So you had to give them some input as to what might make things look better. For example, if they have a, a weak jawline or a prominent nose, you would figure out what lighting and what angles would look best. And so that became a cultivated skill set. Uh, which was very vital in doing uh, portrait photography, but it also seems to be really helpful in doing aesthetics. And um, it certainly has uh, developed in my eye over the years that I've been in aesthetics, but I think that it was um, a nice uh, skill set to have prior to going into aesthetics and understanding the balance of the face and how to uh, accentuate or de-accentuate certain features that may be uh, strengths or weaknesses. Yeah, I, I totally see the connection there. Totally. Because you have to have that eye because so often people will say, oh, I don't like nasolabial folds. And it's you think, oh, well, you put filler in there, but that's not always the case. That's not always solving the problem. A lot of times we're injecting in different areas to kind of lift. So I think without that aesthetic eye, it's not like this black and white formula. You know, it's it's kind of one of those skills that you have to learn or you have to have kind of the artistic or trained eye to really understand how the face is and how light hits and all of those kind of things. I agree. And even from the scientific perspective, there've been a lot of aesthetic studies where they look at what cultures really uh, deem universally attractive. And sometimes there are proportions that um, are very consistent um, among, um, you know, relative ratios between cheeks to lower face that appeal also to the scientific side of a physician. Um, but it's a, it's a mix of um, learning about what is an aesthetic ideal and also just using some natural, um, I guess, visualization of what things will look like when you accentuate the mid face, bringing a little bit more cheek into a, uh, a flattened mid-face. Um, there's definitely a lot of learning that happens, but you have to uh, be willing to learn and not go in with a uh, notion that you already know what you're doing. You have to be willing to learn and listen from people who are better um, and more experienced and incorporate that into your practice. So as you've been growing your practice over the past couple of years, I know that you have, uh, I work with you. We've got. Um, a couple of estheticians there. So what do you feel has been like the greatest value of having estheticians in your practice? Because everyone has a different role that they play, but in, when we're looking at quality of care for the patient, what value do you feel that the esthetician brings? So none, I've, I've yet to meet anybody who knows it all. And so I know my strengths and my weaknesses, but I think that uh, the estheticians that I work with are better at skincare and knowledge of skincare products than I am. I'm trying to learn. Um, I, I'm better at procedures and understanding the, uh, the nuances of the procedures I do, but I certainly uh, look to the estheticians I have to help me out in guiding sometimes the right skincare and problem skin or skin that's not reacting to what I think might do the trick. So I think that the knowledge base that the estheticians have is greater than mine in certain fields. And so that balances out the practice. 
Um, what I also think that they bring to the practice is a uh, set of procedures that I don't do that complements the full spectrum of what a patient really is looking for. And so part of the, um, the best overall approach to get the, the desired results is a combination of what estheticians do um, and what other healthcare providers do. So if I only offered my services, I think I would be missing out on 50% of what a patient really needs, which is long-term skin management and improvement by doing things that I don't do on a daily basis. So through my hydrofacials, through my peels, through skincare. But I also think that the estheticians have a more um, type of interaction uh, with the patients that uh, is a little uh, more balanced than what typically myself or most physicians do. And I think they're uh, wonderful at listening to the patients. But they also incorporate patient concerns when they're seeing them and bring them into potentially procedures that I'm going to do. So from the business side, they're a vital part of my business in um, addressing patient concerns that may not be treatable with esthetician service, but the knowledge of what I can do often will steer a patient into the right treatments for concerns that uh, my services will give solutions to. So a really synergistic relationship. Totally. And I think that uh, I always will try to um, tell patients what is going to be most beneficial for skincare that an esthetician can do. And the estheticians do the same thing. And together, I think it makes a great team. Yeah, totally agree. So when you are, because there are so many estheticians who are looking to get into medical and they're not really sure, you know, if they're qualified or what the next step is or what skill set they need, what do you look for when you're hiring someone and, and would you ever consider someone who hasn't been trained in medical or is it like, like what are the, you know, the boxes that need to be checked to bring someone into your practice? Um, th that's a, that's a great question. I think that I would consider somebody that's not trained um, if they demonstrated the type of um, characteristics that would tell me that they would make a great fit with the right training. Because I think that you and I have both had this discussion that if a person wants to learn, even if they don't know something, they will learn it better than somebody who is not willing to learn. I saw that personally on in my physician training that the best physicians I've ever worked with are those who may not have had as much experience but were willing to learn and absorb everything. And so if I had a potential candidate who may not have the experience of somebody of 10 years in the business, but they demonstrated the type of willingness to be trained, and they also had the type of interactions with you know, myself that would tell me that they're gonna be great with their clients, I would definitely hire them and put the money and the time into training them accordingly, because that person's gonna be a much better employee than somebody who doesn't have those skill sets or doesn't really want to um, do the things that it takes to learn more and to cultivate a skill set that's going to be the best it could be. So sort of like, so our friend Matt Toronto, who is an amazing, amazing consultant, med spa owner in this industry, he always says, hire the smile, train the skill. Yes. So you, I think that that's kind of what, it, it's a easy, simple way to say that there are certain things that can't be trained. You know, your drive, your passion, your desire to serve your patients on a level that's not just get them in, get them out, but really, truly help them. Um, you may not know everything about skin. You may not know everything about peels or whatever, but uh, newsflash, you never will <laughs> because this, right. this industry changes so much. I mean, when I first got into medical aesthetics, I think it was 10 years ago, Botox was still pretty new. And it was like this exciting thing. Then it was still kind of this taboo thing. And, you know, now it's like anyone on the street at least knows what it is, you know? Yeah. So no, I think as an employer, it's easier sometimes in the short term to want to run with somebody that's got experience, but you may be making a long-term mistake. Ideally, it's great to find somebody that's got 
experience and that will to learn and that passion to take care of patients, to do follow-ups, to make sure that the patients are satisfied with everything we do. That's a win-win, but that's hard to find. And I think it's hard to find in any industry to find that type of motivated individual. But on the, on the plus side, when you are that motivated individual that stands out, you've got much less competition. You really can stand out by, me, by being that person. And I think that um, you're right. If you find somebody with the right skill sets, the right passion, they're much easier to train and they will be a much better long-term investment. And they will also be happier that you gave them that opportunity uh, to become uh, the person that maximizes their potential rather than being glossed over for not having that experience. Okay, so just finishing up with one last question here. What advice would you give to estheticians who are listening right now and they're kind of on the fence? Maybe they don't have the confidence, you know, like, or they don't feel that they're qualified, but they really truly have that desire to get into the world of medical aesthetics. What advice would you give to them? Um, I would tell them that nobody knows everything on day one. So don't be discouraged about that. Um, th for me, I'm still learning uh, seven years into my first entry into aesthetics. And it's intimidating because you see so many other people that may be more experienced. Uh, and that's, that's hard for a physician because when we get trained, we are trained to this certain level that you can handle pretty much anything. But when you start a new specialty, it's really tough. And I think that the same would hold true for anybody entering the field of medical aesthetics. Um, so the recommendations I would give are just be yourself and stay true to that passion. Because if you really are thinking about doing aesthetics on the medical side, just like in medicine, I always tell physicians, if it's just because you just want to get in because there's a little bit more money to be made, you're not going to be happy. You really have to want to do it because that's what you want to do. So with that being said, one of the things that has always served me well um, would be to try to read or get as much in, uh, education as you can on your own. And so there are some great basic books out there um, that will help you understand subject matter that will be part of the medical world. And you don't have to do that on day one on your job interview, but along the way, read as much as you can and learn as much as you can outside of work um, so that you will have the best educational background to be the best uh, provider of aesthetic services on the medical side that you can be. But when it comes to what I would look for from an employee would be somebody that would demonstrate the type of drive to both take care of the patients to the best of their ability, making good follow-up calls the next day after a new service or within the week, following up patients that may have not come back. And if somebody's not happy with somebody, try to make them happy. It's not hard. And sometimes I think that people are often reluctant to make follow-up calls because there might be a little bit of a, I don't want to hear something that may be bad but there's always room to correct issues and keep that patient in your book. Um, not following up with patients is probably the easiest way to lose people because that demonstrated level of service that you can provide by being motivated sets you apart. And we see that in our practice that um, when we follow up and we want to make sure that people are doing okay, they're really surprised to hear from us many times. So, those type of organizational skills and drive to make sure that you keep your patients uh, happy and give them the best services will make you stand out and your employer will be very happy and you'll be busier a lot quicker. And so it's win-win. In my first year of practicing aesthetics, I really wanted to be the best that I could be. And I would ask every one of my patients, I would say, I really want to get better and improve. Was there anything about your service that I could have done better? And it was just simply, and that's a scary question to ask because you're asking for feedback about what you could have done better, which is like terrifying because you want to think that you have already done the best. But I think being open to constructive feedback, um, a lot of people will give you constructive feedback with love and take it in that way that it's like, this is helping you to get better. And uh, if you can, 
face that and say, you know, like, what can I do better next time? And then apply it. You will grow exponentially. I agree. Um, and I think that that's hard to do because I'm a type of person that always wants to make people happy. And so 10% of our clientele may not ever be happy. And it's hard to hear that, but you have to, because there are patients that it doesn't matter what you do and you get better over time at screening those patients out and trying not to be a part of the regular part of the practice. Um, but if you're very sensitive to criticism, it's a hard pill to swallow, to listen that you may have done something that didn't satisfy that patient. But for the 90 to 95% of patients that you did make happy, not only would it make you, will it give you more motivation to keep doing what you're doing, but you're going to learn a trick or two. And I always ask people that are new to my practice, um, for example, if someone got filler, well, what did you like about it? Or what did you not like about it when it was done previously? What did you not like? I mean, obviously bruising is always a, a, a no-no, but I learn and I ask my patients because I want to do it better next time. So if somebody bruises, maybe I'll switch them to a cannula in a place where I never experienced bruising. But it's hard to take negative feedback, but it will make you better. It makes you grow as a provider. But if you're super sensitive, you, you got to get over that. But over time, you'll find that that feedback loop is integral to giving uh, to growing your business as much as you can to make your patients happy. You got to listen to them. Absolutely. All right, you guys. So thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Dr. Petropoulos, thank you so much for your time. If you guys want to keep this conversation going, be sure to head over to the Spa Marketing Made Easy Facebook group. We can continue to answer your questions. Um, and I will catch you guys on the next episode. Bye. Thanks for having me on, Daniela. Of course.